Oh, good. Did you pause that, Chad? We'll just leave that there for a minute. Marco made that video, which makes me feel like I'm about to watch a Marvel movie. <laughs> I need a cape. But what a wonderful plug for uh, VBS, and they're out in the hallway this morning. Uh, you have opportunities to sign up, opportunities for service, so please see them out there. Uh, but while we just stay here for a moment, you do need to read the credits. <laughs> Costume designer, whoever wanted it. <laughs> uh, seriously, we're glad that you are here. Please uh, sign up and help us with VBS. Uh, there are several things that are up and coming in the life of the church. Uh, Twisted Turns is their VBS, uh, which is out in the lobby. We've already said that in the foyer. Uh, Preteen camp is coming up, and Graduation Sunday is also coming up here in a couple of weeks. So we'll, we'll celebrate our seniors and all of those who have graduated. We're glad that you are here with us in the room this morning. We are excited about worship. We're excited about God's word being poured out. We're excited about being together and fellowshipping with one another uh, through Christ and his family. Let's stand together and open our service in song. Raging at my feet, I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sounds of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face Every fear of the unknown I can hear All God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome Same power that rose Jesus from the grave Same power that commands the dead to wake Listen are true in his strength there is nothing we can do yes we know there are greater things in store we will not be overtaken will not be overcome same power that rose jesus from the grave Same power that moves mountains when he 
speaks. Same power that can calm the raging sea lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. Thank you for singing. You may be seated. It's time for the children to come down. Kids, come on down and meet Miss Sarah in the front. We'll have some time with her this morning. How are y'all this morning? I'm so happy to see all of you. Can I squeeze in here? There's so many of you. Who remembers some of you that were here? And if you weren't, then you've probably heard this before. Have you heard of the Holy Spirit? Yes. 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 Do you know who left the Holy Spirit for us? Jesus. Jesus. How come? What's the Holy Spirit here to do? Want to teach the lesson? <laughs> That's right. Elijah said that when Jesus died, he said he was leaving the disciples and they were his friends. So they were kind of sad, weren't they? They were sad that Jesus was leaving, but he said, I'm going to leave something with you to help you. And remember, we were talking about that the Holy Spirit helps us with our mission. We were talking about with Miss Susan, some of you that were here, our mission. What's our mission, Andrew? Okay. Do you remember what our mission is? Do you remember what our mission is? Yeah, what's our mission? To, um, to do what Jesus was doing. And what was he doing? He was teaching. Okay, we're not playing, we're not playing that again today. But we're going to talk about this. But hold on, listen. We are going to talk about, guys, so remember, when the Holy Spirit was left behind, that was to be our help, and all you have to do is ask, and so when we ask Jesus into our heart, guess what? We are no longer mortal. We will live and have eternal life forever, so does anybody, y'all ever seen any fruits or vegetables? What happens if a fruit or a vegetable sits out on the counter for a long time and doesn't get eaten? Just say it. What happens? It rots as they get yucky. Okay, so that's like the cycle of life, right? And where, how does a, do you know how a fruit or a vegetable starts? How does it, before it grows, by a seed? So you got to put a seed in the ground, and then what, you have to wait, and what happens? It grows into a thing. Okay, what happens if you don't take care of it while it's supposed to be growing, if you don't water it, or it doesn't get any sun? It won't grow either? No. And what will happen, yeah, will the leaves get brown and crunchy? Yes. And ugly? Okay, so listen, though, that's just the life cycle, okay? But when we have Jesus in our hearts, our bodies change. We're no longer perishable. Y'all ever heard that word? Perishable is like a fruit or a vegetable or meat or things that grow from the ground that if you leave them out, they get yucky. So once we have Jesus in our heart, hold on, we are no longer perishable we be have an imperishable body. And that means our spiritual body will live on forever with Jesus. Y'all remember that? Yes? Yes. So when we have Jesus in our hearts, guys, you know what? All of our sins can be forgiven, and they won't be spoiled. Our hearts won't be spoiled. Instead... We will live on after we leave our earthly bodies. Yes. Do you have something to tell me or ask me what? Are y'all ready? Well, so who do y'all have here to help you while Jesus is waiting for us? What or who? Say it out loud. The Holy Spirit, okay? And if you need help or want help, what do you have to do? 
You have to do what? Say it out loud, Landon. You have to pray. All you have to do is ask. So how do you ask God? You pray. So y'all want to bow your heads and close your eyes right now when we pray? And we ask for the Holy Spirit to help us. Are you ready? Okay. One, two, three, bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all of our friends here. Thank you for making it possible for each one of these kids to have another friend here who believes the same thing that they do. And so help us to all be a team and to carry out your mission of bringing others to you, Lord, by telling them and showing them what your love is. We thank you for this beautiful day and help us to be like you in everything we do and everything we say, Lord. Amen. Stand with me. Let's continue to sing together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to be in. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My, my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to tense. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. You have made me new, now life begins with you. Hold your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner. Was a ransom you faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. The Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced. Heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all
next hymn we're going to sing together is One Day, and the words in this at the chorus, the refrain that we'll sing is, Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. I appreciate you guys this morning. I can really hear you singing from the stage this morning, and it's so invigorating for us to be worshiping with you this morning. Let's continue to sing together. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing my sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glory a stay, one day the grave could conceal him no longer. The stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascending, my Lord, evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sin far away. Rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glory stay please be seated <laughs> so will it be with the resurrection of the dead, the body that is sown imperishable, it has raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became living, being the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after that he, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven, as was the earthly earthly man so are those who are of the earth and as it is the man from heaven so also are those who are of heaven and just as we have borne the likeliness of the earthly man so shall we bear the likeliness of the man from heaven i declare to you brothers of that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in, the, in a flash, in the twinkling of, a, of an eye, at the last triumph, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must cloth 
itself with the imperishable, and the mortal will well, the mortal will with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has between swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And so
pray with me, please. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given to each of us this morning, Lord, to be in your house. Lord, thank you for the many, many, many blessings that you have already shared with each of us this morning. And thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you share with us every single day. The ones that we don't stop and say thank you for, Lord. The small blessings, as well as the Lord's blessings. Lord, thank you for a church that, that loves us. Thank you for our church that ministers to us. Lord, thank you for loving people. But thank you most of all for you loving us. Lord, just like many churches today, our church is struggling financially. Lord, we're instructed to give back our tithes to you. We're also instructed to give back some offerings to you, which are separate from our tithes. So, Lord, as we give back our tithes and our offerings this morning, Lord, I just pray that they would be blessed in this church, Lord, to do your will, to reach out to this community, Lord. Lord, I do believe things are changing. I think things are changing here. And we look forward to those mighty changes, Lord, for your hand in those changes. Lord, I pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus, and I pray that you would bless each and every giver here this morning, Lord. Because it's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Of the faith, 
with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb that was slain forever he shall face to face when he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord there will be a day we shout the hymns of heaven with angels and the saints we raise a mighty underway here, I just want to say a special word of thanks to, to Jeffrey Bowling, our worship leader. Um, I don't know if y'all <laughs> quite understand just how difficult Jeffrey's task is week in and week out, preparing the worship service that we enjoy every single week, putting together hymns that we've loved for decades and contemporary songs like that one that came out just last year and trying to make it cohesive in a way that contributes to one worship experience. Then on top of it all, every now and then you have a Sunday where a song that was supposed to be a duet gets turned into a solo 10 minutes before the worship service gets started. That's what happened today. And so I'm just really thankful for Jeffrey and all that he does for our church. And I hope that you are as well. If we move into the the message, I want to I want to say a prayer before we do that, before I launch into what Scripture has to tell us today. Um, So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, I am so thankful this morning to be here with my church family. So thankful that you have given us this place and these people, brothers and sisters in Christ, people that we can walk beside day after day, people who encourage us, people who comfort us, people who hold us accountable, people who pray for us, and people for whom we can do all of those things as well. So Lord, thank you for this church family. Thank you for this time that we have each week to exalt your name, to lift you up in praise, to declare with our songs and our prayers and our gifts and our very presence, that you are holy and that you are worthy to be praised. So Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for this time of worship. And thank you most of all for sending your son, for sending Jesus to be born, to live, to die, and to rise again so that even as we have sung this morning, we can know eternal life with you so that we can enjoy the fruits of that resurrection, so that we can be transformed in you. Lord, as I bring this message now, this message from your holy word, I pray that I would be sharing your words, and I pray that in doing so, you would bless our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that I pray all these things. Amen. Endings are important. For any good story, a good ending is necessary for that story to really reach the kind of culmination that it deserves. You need a good ending for the story to be good. I mean, if you think about some of your favorite movies over the generations... 
think about how differently we would look on those stories if you just tweaked the ending just a little bit. Not completely rewrote the story, you understand, but if you just change the ending a little bit, think how the story would be different. Think about at the end of Gone with the Wind, if in that moment when Clark Gable is standing there at the door, if he said to Scarlet, frankly, my dear, you've got a point. I should stick around and stay with you. <laughs> That's a different movie, isn't it? That, that ending doesn't quite have the resonance as the original line, which I'm not supposed to say from the pulpit. Move forward a couple decades. What about if at the end of the first Star Wars movie, the, the real Star Wars movie, the one that they used to just call Star Wars, what if at the end of that movie, if Luke, instead of using the Force and firing that shot and destroying the Death Star, what if he instead said, Obi-Wan, be quiet, I can hit this shot on my own, and used his targeting system and missed the shot by just this much and a different rebel fighter came in and destroyed the Death Star? You get the same effect. Death Star's still destroyed. Good guys still win, but it's not quite the same, is it? It's not quite as good as if Luke, the hero of the story, is the one who does it. What if in Avengers Infinity War, Thor had actually aimed for the head? What if they had taken Thanos out in that first movie and we don't get an Avengers Endgame at all? We don't get the scene with the portals. We don't get Avengers Assemble. We don't get this climactic moment what if Thor had just aimed for the head? The ending's a little bit different. See, a good story needs a good ending. It needs that perfect conclusion that ties it all together. A good story needs a good ending. For the last month, we have been telling the story that Scripture has to say about, about us, about yeah these lives that God gives us, these bodies that God gives us, and why he gives them to us, and why he gives them to us the way that he does so. And so our story began at the very beginning of everything, began in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, when God created humanity by forming us from the dust of the earth and breathing life into us, creating us in his image, from the very beginning, God has made clear that these bodies are given to us and given by him, and they are special and they are different from those of the animals that roam the earth. But we talked about how these bodies we are given are, even as 1 Corinthians says here, they are perishable. They are fallible. They are fallen. And that is because of sin in this world, because of our disobedience, beginning with Adam and Eve and carrying on through. Because of that, sin has corrupted this world and indeed corrupted our very bodies. We are less than what God intended for us to be. And we are prone to sickness and we are prone to weakness and we are ultimately prone to death. And so God in his grace and his mercy, in his love and his power, sent his son, Jesus. Sent him as a man, fully God, but fully human, to be born as a baby, just like all of us, to live a human life and ultimately to die a human death upon the cross. Suffering, bleeding, and dying for our sins, only then to be raised victorious on Easter Sunday. And then we saw how we now, with Christ ascended into heaven, we are now called to be his body here on this earth, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, carrying out his mission until that day when he returns. We are called with our bodies to give them over to him in service and in mission. This is the story we've been telling for a month now. And now it's time to come to the end of this story. The end of what we do with these bodies when they reach their conclusion. And what God has to tell us about them. We need to know how the story ends. 
So what I want to do this morning with this little bit of time that I am given is to give you, have you ever heard the game Two Truths and a Lie? We're going to play Two Lies and a Truth, or Two Misconceptions, to be kinder. Two Misconceptions and the Truth about what Scripture tells us is the end of our story. So I want to begin with that first misconception here this morning. And that is the idea that the end of our story is that bodily death is the end. That the day will come when you will breathe your last. And that's it. Game over. Story ended. Close the book. You're done. That that is the end of the human story. That when your heart stops beating, when your breaths start flowing, your story comes to an end. That is the worldly assumption. That is the assumption that we see in our world. You're given this one life, and when it comes to an end, you come to an end. You're done. And there's good reason for that to be the assumption. Can we say that? Because that's what you see. That is what you can witness When somebody's body stops working, your experience with them is done. You don't see some spirit rise up out of their body. You don't continue talking with them. You don't continue living with them. When their body reaches its end, your experience with them comes to an end. There's a reason that that's the assumption of how things work. There is no faith required to understand that bodily death is the end. What you see is what you get. But I said this is a misconception, remember? And that's because of what Scripture has to tell us. Because the basic promise of salvation is that eternal reward awaits those who place their faith in Jesus. If there's one verse that you have heard before that you're familiar with that you've seen in the end zone at a football game. It's John 3, 16. This idea that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, we've talked about this, that whoever believes in him, instead of perishing, instead of bodily death being the end, instead of perishing, will have, what does it say there? Eternal life. Elsewhere in Romans 6.23, Paul tells us that the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The basic promise of salvation is that if we give our lives to Jesus, if we place our faith in him, if we believe that what he did on the cross has the power to save us from our sin— then we receive eternal life with God. Then death is not the end. That's the promise that you see on Easter Sunday when Jesus comes walking out of that tomb. This idea that death has been defeated by Jesus. That this thing, death, that we have such fear of in this life is not, in fact, the end of the story. That just as Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, death has been swallowed up in victory that we can say truly, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? That the power of death has been conquered by our Lord Jesus. And so this first misconception for those of us who place our faith in Jesus is set to the side. Bodily death is not the end of your story. If you place your faith in Jesus. So let me get then to the second misconception. This one, you're going to have to listen real close, okay? Not only is bodily death not the end, a disembodied heaven is not the end. Let me talk about that here for a minute. See, here's the assumption that many of us have. That when you die, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, 
that when you die, your body comes to an end, but your soul or your spirit, it departs and goes to heaven to be with God forever and ever and always. I'm sure that rings a bell for just about all of us. You die, your body is done, your soul goes to be with God forever and ever. There's good reason for us to think that. Scripture says some things about that. For example, you look at what Paul says in Philippians, where he says that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And why is to die gain? Why, is it, why would it be better for Paul in his circumstances to go and to leave this earthly plane? Because if he does so, I will depart and be with Christ. That in some sense, when we die, we are with the Lord. Jesus himself promised this to the thief on the cross, the man hanging on a cross right next to him. The thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you remember what Jesus said to him? Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. There is this promise that when people of faith die, that in an instant we are with Christ, that we are in some mysterious spiritual sense with our Lord. That's why you see on tombstones this idea of rest in peace because we are given the peace and the comfort of knowing that when this earthly life comes to an end, we will be with God. So what's the problem then with what I said before? I I said that it was a misconception that a disembodied heaven is our end, that when we die, our soul goes to be with God forever and ever, our body left in the grounds. What's the problem here? The problem is that word forever. We're not making it to the end of the story. We're not getting to the good part. We're not getting to the part that our Lord Jesus promised in word and in deed. So if bodily death is not the end, if disembodied heaven is not the end, a life of our souls floating around the clouds forever and always, then what is the promise? What is the hope? What is the good news of Jesus Christ? I've given you the two lies. Here's the one truth. The end of the story, which is in fact no end at all, is not a bodily death or a disembodied heaven. It is resurrection life. It is not only our souls being with God, but our bodies raised up. That is what Paul is talking about here when he says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. The dead will be raised imperishable, he says. And here's what I love so much. We will be changed. Think back to the beginning of the story for a moment. When God created us, when God gave us these bodies of flesh and bone formed out of the dust, when he breathed life into us, in those days, man and woman walked with God in the paradise of Eden. And our sin fouled it all up. Our disobedience took away that fellowship. And all of a sudden we had this separation between heaven and earth. All of a sudden, we could not be with God in the way he had always intended. And these bodies and this world around us were corrupted, were perverted, were made less than what he intended for them to be. These bodies are perishable. This world is perishable, mortal, prone to wander, prone to suffer, prone to die. But for those who place our faith in Jesus, we are given the promise that someday, come soon, Lord Jesus, someday, these bodies will be transformed. 
that someday creation will give way to new creation. That someday the perishable will give way to the imperishable. That someday weakness will give way to strength, that the physical will give way to the spiritual. That someday we will see a renewal and a restoration and, yes, a resurrection. The likes of which Christ's resurrection is the first fruits. He is the firstborn of that resurrection. He shows us what it looks like. And make no mistake, It is not a disembodied, floating around, ethereal kind of thing. No. You remember after Christ rose from the dead, you could touch the scars in his hands. He ate with his disciples. He walked with his disciples. He lived with them until he ascended into heaven. And we are promised that on that day when Christ returns... That on that day when he comes to judge the living and the dead, that this will give way to something so much better. That this, this world in which we live, will give way to something so much better. To what Revelation calls a new heaven and a new earth where the home of God is now among mortals. Where we once again know that fellowship, that union with God that he always intended for us. What we are promised is not simply an escape from this big bad world. We are promised a transformation and a restoration of this world something better than we could possibly imagine. I've got to tell you, whenever I planned this sermon series, this idea of what, why God gave us these, these bodies, why we have what we have, this was the message I was ready to get to the whole time. Because as I told you that very first week, I think we have this idea, we have this understanding that all that really matters is what happens up here and in here, what we think and what we believe. But make no mistake, God has given us what he has given us for a reason. It matters what we think, it matters what we believe, but it matters also what we do. It matters how we use these bodies he has given us. It matters how we participate in this world. Because the day is coming, and may it be soon, when the Lord will transform all we see. When the Lord will restore everything we see. When he will put the pieces back together again. And in the meantime, in this interim, we are given the privilege of singing the hymn of heaven. We are given the immense privilege privilege and the responsibility of living into that future reality right now. Of playing by the rules of that future road right now. Of being resurrection people today. Not waiting till tomorrow to practice restoration in our lives. But being resurrection people in the here and the now. Someday we will see it with our own eyes. Someday we will see him face to face. And for now, we live by faith instead of by sight. For now, we practice resurrection in the way we live. God has given us what he has given us to think, to feel, to believe, but also to do to practice our faith day by day, to be vessels of hope in this world. So may we be embodied believers. May we practice our faith in how we live. Would you pray with me? 
Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for the hope, excuse me, for the hope of resurrection. I thank you, Lord, for the hope of eternal life. Life that begins the moment we breathe our last, when we go to be with you in a spiritual sense. But a promise that is fully consummated only at your return. When our souls and our bodies are reunited once again, when we enjoy and experience the resurrection of which Christ is the firstborn, when we see with our own eyes the restoration in which we place our faith now. So Lord, as people who believe and who proudly proclaim that Christ is risen, that death is conquered, that a new day is dawning, May we live into that future reality today. May the sweet by and by happen in the here and now. May we practice the way of Jesus with these bodies we've been given until the day that those bodies are transformed in your image. It's in Jesus' name that I pray all these things. Amen. In just a moment... We'll sing a hymn together. Our worship will continue with that song. But before we do that, I want to issue an invitation to each one of you. I'll be down here at the front while we sing. And this morning, if you want to come forward, if you want to make your own profession of faith in the one who died and rose again so that you could be saved, then come meet me at the front. I won't hand you a microphone. I'm not going to make you talk in front of everybody. We'll just talk. We'll just pray. If this morning you want to join our church, become a part of this body of believers, I'll be here to receive you right here in this time. I invite you, I encourage you to come forward. For the rest of us, our response to what we've heard this morning will be the singing of this hymn. It's number 282. Ask ye what great thing I know. Let's stand together and let's sing. Ask ye what great thing I know that delights and stirs me so. What thy reward I win, whose the name I glory. Crucified, who is life in life to me, who the death of death will be, will place me on his right with a countless host of light, Jesus Christ the crucified. This is that great thing I know, this delights and stirs me so. Faith in him who died to save, him who triumphed o'er the grave, Jesus Christ the crucified. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Just two quick things before we dismiss. I'll do this quickly so you can stay standing. The first is that I want to say thanks to those who attended the yard party that we had yesterday at my house. We had a great time. Several of us ate way too many hot dogs and are still feeling a little bit this morning, Uh, but we had a good time getting to know our neighbors, uh, getting to be ambassadors for the church, and so thankful to those who participated in that. It was a really good time getting to meet our neighbors, and we were grateful for that and for your presence. And then the second thing is on your way out. You saw the table when you came in. Make sure you stop by it on the way out. Uh, for Vacation Bible School. One thing I want to make sure you know about is we're trying something new this year. Um, It's designed for parents who are dropping their kids off, grandparents who are dropping their kids off. 
but by all means, everybody is invited to it. We are having an adult vacation Bible school class this year. Uh, It'll be taught by our pastor emeritus, Larry Davis. And so if that's something that you want to stay for, we would love for you to volunteer, but we would also love for you to participate. And so we're having that class this year. We're going to give that a try while the kids are doing their thing. The adults will do theirs as well. And so you can sign up for that at the table as well. I want to encourage you to, to take part in that if you're not already volunteering. Um, so as we head out, as you all get ready to bottleneck at that table, um, because that's where we're going next, let me leave you with this word now of, of benediction, that we proclaim together that Christ is risen, that he is risen indeed. And so as people with faith in his resurrection and ours to come, may we go forward as embodied people of faith. Go in peace. Amen.